right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in the first of Chester Takeaway in that briefing discussions with a leading expert on a question of importance for us, if it's in the army or wider British defense or wider British foreign policy um, um, network. Um, obviously, these discussions are um, personal conversations between two um, academics and experts, so they reflect our personal views. And today we wanted to talk about um, Saudi Arabia. Why? Um, because the country matters a lot for us. It has been a close ally and partner um, for many decades now. And what happens in Saudi Arabia, its foreign policy, its policies on energy supply, etc have important implications um, for the UK's Middle East policy but defense engagement but also regional perspectives as well um, and we are thrilled to have um, Mike Stevens with us who is a, a associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute um, he's no stranger to a lot of you he has partaken in chess events before he's written for us and he's been a good friend um, to us as well uh, Mike let's just jump in um, straight into this conversation um, sure. obviously um, UK has a long history of engagement with Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. working very closely but the country has been going through a very fascinating transformation and recently we have seen the news reports on um, allegations and charges brought against very senior royal family members as well as defense and security officials on allegations of corruption and this wasn't the first wave of such <coughs> sure. what are the background of these developments and how are we to read this well, obviously, there have been two series um, of arrests made in the past month. And as you say, it, it's not really um, out of the ordinary. Um, Mohammed bin Salman, who is 34-year-old Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, has, over the last three years, solidified his grip on power in a way that could be described as sort of modern authoritarianism. Uh, he has appealed to the public uh, for support in two or three now uh, big anti-corruption drives against civil servants, but also against family members. And he's been very, very clear that he won't tolerate corruption in any shape or form. Uh, it's just the way that he's gone about it has always been, I think, a little too much, too quickly, which has made people extremely nervous um, and fits into a pattern of behavior that some people would describe as rash and perhaps not fully understanding of the consequences of his actions. And on top of that, there is this, it seems to be, particular way of isolating family members. And on this particular occasion, uh, two princes, Prince Ahmed bin Abdulaziz and Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, both of whom had been interior minister, uh, and Prince Mohammed bin Nayef had been the former crown prince before he was um, deposed by King Salman, and MBS became uh, the crown prince, were arrested. The charge was supposedly treason, although no charge was actually brought. So uh, the two princes were detained for questioning. Um, they seem to be fine. Uh, they live in very nice surroundings uh, in their palaces, so I'm sure that they're doing perfectly well. But what I think was interesting was the message that Mohammed bin Salman was sending out. He was very concerned that there were a number of tongues wagging inside the family, that there was gossip going on about how he was able to run the country's finances, its foreign policy, its defense policy, undertake all these social reforms at the same time. And a lot of people were becoming quite unhappy. And I think this was a disciplinary measure designed to say to princes across the family, but also senior civil servants who might be grumbling, listen, get in line. If I can do this to Mohammed bin Nayef and Prince Ahmed, then I can do it to you. So you all better listen up and stick with me and I'm the one in charge and don't anyone forget it. Um, he, it seems to be quite an intense actually context, isn't it, Mike? I mean, he's facing clearly a very intense political pressure, so securing his own um, governance from now on, his reign, he doesn't want contenders or challenges, but he's also facing huge number of domestic, economic, mm. social, um, and eco um, um, political challenges. What are some of the yeah. key domestic factors outside of his control that are actually shaping his policies or his, how he's handling this transition process? Well, I think one of the, the biggest issues that Saudi Arabia faces is it's just a simple product of demography. Um, I mean, there are large numbers that go out there of 60% of the country is under 30, 55% of the country is under 30. What we know is that a lot of people in Saudi Arabia are under 30 years of age. That means two things. One, you've got to create jobs for them. Two, they need somewhere to live. This is a huge challenge for the Saudi government and how to create enough jobs for all these young people coming onto the job market. Not only that, 
It's not just men. With all the social reforms that Mohammed bin Salman has enacted, he wants women to play a much, much bigger role in the kingdom and in its economy. He wants 30% of women to be in full-time employment by 2030, which is a big step up from a country which previously was pretty conservative and where women were only really employed in Western companies. Um, but we are seeing a really, really big shift in terms of the social balance and dynamics between male and female, where they're being encouraged to work together in spaces that up until very recently, they were not supposed to be working in. And so that is the key challenge, is to get more jobs available. And we're looking at something like 250,000 new graduates a year coming onto the job market. Number two, the truth is that Saudi Arabia, despite all of these reforms that have been put in place by Mohammed bin Salman, relies on oil. And it relies on oil exports to the tune of about 7 million barrels a day uh, to fund a huge number of its government programs and to create jobs. Here's the problem. By 2034, according to the latest IMF estimates, we're going to hit peak oil. And look at where we are right now, of course, with the coronavirus. Demand has dropped by 20%. And you've got price wars going on between the US, Russia and Saudi Arabia. That money is not there. It's not a stable source of income. The price of oil that Saudi Arabia needs for its budgets to break even is around $83 a barrel. Right now, it's heading towards $20 a barrel. You are looking at deficits in Saudi spending of nearly 10% of GDP and increasing year upon year. So the truth is, is that they're dealing with a very, very difficult problem. They want to make the private sector more productive but they've got less money with which to do that with, and the government has to drive that reform. And so there's a bit of a, a Gordian knot here, if you like, which is that in order to make this reform happen, you've got to spend money. To do that, you need oil and you need gas wealth. And that's the key, is that to do all of these programs, to get away from oil and gas wealth, you need oil and gas wealth. And so how you get out of this cycle is very, very, very difficult. I think Mohammed bin Salman is just simply beset with a number of challenges that he does not have uh, the tools to fix at the moment. But that's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, his foreign policy, his regional ambitions have been quite assertive. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. we have seen it with his desire to escalate with Russia, vis-a-vis -vis questions about sure. um, the, the US, Russia, um, Saudi um, triangle of oil prices and et cetera, but also escalation yeah. with Iran, involvement in Yemen, even footprint yeah. in North Africa, um, and a yeah. desire to be much more assertive globally to protect his own name and his own place. Um, and it seems mm. like um, he doesn't necessarily have the long-term funds to be able to maintain that ambition, but at the moment, I, I, I'm not necessarily seeing a change or accommodation of the limits of that. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, for the moment, of course, Saudi Arabia has one of the most valuable companies, if not the most valuable company on earth, which is Aramco. Uh, it floated 1.5% of that on the stock market. It was a domestic stock market that they did that. I'm afraid to say that international investors were not particularly impressed uh, by Aramco's uh, valuation and, its, and, it, and what happened with the initial public offering. Nevertheless, that gives them something with which to borrow money against. They have stuff that they can use as collateral or that they can use to guarantee lenders uh, that they can pay back some of these loans. So they've been issuing government bonds. Yesterday, the finance minister said they're going to increase um, uh, bond issuances. So they're going to be borrowing up to 50% of GDP when they had previously last week said that they only needed 20% of GDP borrowing. So they are massively ramping up uh, for borrowing their way out of this crisis. Here's the problem. With the coronavirus issue, we don't know how long the crisis is going to last. This could be 18 months. It could be two years. And, you know, on the really, really pessimistic uh, projections, we could be looking at 10 years of depressed economy. Just remember, MBS's vision for transforming the country is 2030. We're in 2020, right? So he's running out of time to make this vision work if he wants to get it solidified and put in place to change the country uh, before it's too late. So he's hit some really, really tough challenges. I think Saudi Arabia, obviously for now, is going to keep going with its foreign policy um, because it sees around every corner, Iran and Yemen, Iran expanding its influence in, in Bahrain, for example, or in uh, Iraq, where it's obviously facing off against the United States. Um, but here's the issue, is that Mohammed bin Salman for the last three years has enacted a fairly aggressive foreign policy, but it's not got him much. So if you look at areas in which the Saudis have tried to push their weight around, they actually haven't delivered the results that they wanted. Take, for example, Lebanon. 
Uh, they tried desperately uh, to get the government of Saad Hariri, the former prime minister of Lebanon, to push Hezbollah out of the political space. That didn't work. They took a drastic step of inviting Saad Hariri to Riyadh and then effectively making him do a statement on live TV saying that he was going to resign and trying to engineer the politics of Lebanon that way. It failed dismally. Then you had issues to do with them picking a fight with Canada over a series of tweets. That backfired as well. They picked a fight with Germany over uh, rhetoric around arms sales. That hasn't gone well. Um, and so the worst one of which, you know, culminated in, in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, done by agents of the, uh, of the Saudi state, of course. Um, and even the Saudis have admitted now that there was guilt from the Saudi state on that, which has caused all sorts of damage reputationally for Mohammed bin Salman and for Saudi Arabia in general. It's scared away foreign investors. And so the kingdom has been trying to do all of these things at once, but it's been making a lot of mistakes. And just as it seemed, and, and really from my perspective, I felt that the royal court in Saudi Arabia had started to understand what needed to be done to push Saudi Arabia forward. The coronavirus hits. Mm -hmm. Now, if that isn't bad luck, I don't know what is. Of course, it wasn't Mohammed bin Salman's fault that the, the, the virus you know, spread around the world as it did. And actually, the Saudis have done quite well to lock the country down, and they're not suffering uh, in the way that perhaps you know, uh, some of these European countries are. But nevertheless, this is really couldn't have come at a worse time for Mohammed bin Salman. Just as they were getting out of this problem of being seen as a little bit reckless in the region. Remember, their facilities were also attacked by Iran last year in October, and they were made to look pretty toothless in the face of Iranian aggression. And just as the economy was beginning to turn around, bam, in comes the coronavirus. So it's really been quite a difficult two years uh, for Mohammed bin Salman, but also for everyday Saudis who are just trying to get their businesses off the ground. They're trying to get the private sector working. And it's been a hard, hard few years. Yeah, um, just one aspect of the foreign policy portfolio, Mike, the question of Iran. Obviously, we have seen the escalation of tensions at the start of 2020, which feels so far away behind us that we were talking about World War III. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the strike yeah. against Qasem Soleimani, but now it yeah. looks like a benign moment, actually, 2020 yeah. hasn't ended. But it's very interesting that Saudi Arabia, even though it was very vocal about Iran and very directly involved with um, some of the reactions given to Iran in the region mm. and other places, mm. it kind of dimmed its public rhetoric, its engagement, and kind of docked down a bit. As as U.S. and yeah. Iran escalation increased, um, even in the region, we have seen even Netanyahu um, not really necessarily maximizing the moment, and Israeli defense and security establishment also calming down a bit. Um, is that a reflection of pragmatism on his behalf? In other words, um, he knows that actually there are limits to what can be achieved with escalation with Iran. Obviously, UK has um, worked with European allies mm. to follow another path, i.e., a diplomatic de-escalation. Yeah rather than yeah. a much more um, um, closer relationship with Saudi Arabia and US and Israel on escalation or a harsh response to Iran. Is this a sign of how he might react to further crises on the horizon? In other words, economic conditions, political conditions at home um, will actually um, contain the reactions when they reach a critical conjuncture. So here's the first point. I think that you know some of the economic problems they're having um, at home, and of course, um, let's be honest, you know, Iran is now also being hammered by a combination of U.S. sanctions and the coronavirus, which I think we all know that Iran has had a terrible time um, with dealing with the coronavirus. So actually, I think you know both Saudi Arabia and Iran right now have just got bigger issues to deal with. But having said that, and until what six weeks ago, where, you know, when I was uh, talking with you at Chaser. It, it really was interesting to see how the Saudis, who had been talking, and specifically Mohammed bin Salman, since 2016, have been talking about the threat of Iran, how dangerous Iran was, and that Saudi Arabia would take it upon itself to, to undertake measures to face down the threat of Iran. When that moment came, Saudi Arabia was directly attacked by drones and missiles from Iran. They did not respond. And not only did they not respond, they made themselves look rather foolish because they had this big press conference where they laid out all the wreckage of these drones and these missiles. They said this is all to do with Iranian-backed militias and this, is, and this is all aggression from Iran. And then when asked to name a country that was behind it, they couldn't do it because the United States wasn't there for them. I think that has been the single biggest shock for Mohammed bin Salman. Saudi Arabia, as I said before, and it's really important to note, because for people like you and me in this field, I don't think we could ever have imagined Iran directly attacking Saudi Arabia 10 years ago. 
it did attack Saudi Arabia. It attacked oil facilities in Saudi Arabia, the very beating heart of the Saudi economy. The US did nothing. It did not respond. And that has been an unbelievable game changer in terms of how Mohammed bin Salman thinks about security in the region. Of course, escalation is not good for anyone. It's not good for the UAE. It's not good for Qatar. It's not good for Kuwait. And it's definitely not good for Iraq, as we've seen since the killing of Qasem Soleimani. I mean, the US and Iran have been playing out their, their war games there. But here's the question is, what does Mohammed bin Salman do now? Saudi Arabia was revealed to be, well, I don't want to call it a paper tiger, but it certainly didn't respond when provoked. And that is a really, really troubling question, because if you are in Riyadh thinking about how unstable the region is, and you've been exposed as effectively not being able to stand up to the bully in the room, what's going to happen next? Now, again, I come back to my initial point, which is that Iran just simply has bigger problems to deal with right now. Um, economically, it's in a terrible state. And of course, following the killing of Hassan Soleimani um, earlier this year, they looked very incompetent when they shot their own plane down. And there's been a little bit of a quiet period now, which I think has been good for everybody. But what was very, very interesting was when I was talking to some of my sources in the Gulf, when Qasem Soleimani was killed, the Saudis uh, contacted through back channels uh, Tehran and made it very clear that they were not consulted about this, that they did not approve of it, and that they did not want to see any escalation between Iran and Saudi Arabia as a result. So what's fascinating about this period is that we've seen this boiling rhetoric, this heated tension, it's come to the sort of apex where both sides were staring down the barrel and Saudi Arabia has chosen to go for the detente route. The question in the long run is what does that mean? Does that mean using President Obama's language three or four years ago that Saudi Arabia and Iran will learn to share the region? This is a huge question right now. And I think it's going to be a very interesting one. And once this coronavirus issue sort of dissipates, whether both countries can come to the table, because it looked to me like they were starting to understand that the other one wasn't going to budge and that they couldn't get the other one to budge. But we, we shall see. There are some variables here. Of course, Trump, whether he gets reelected, whether he decides to pursue some sort of um, policy of, of doing a deal with the Iranians, who knows? The question is, however, what does Saudi Arabia do if the US does not decide to take its side on questions of regional security? If support, for example, for Yemen and the Yemen war from the UK and the US is ramped down, how does Saudi Arabia fill that hole? And the answer is they can't. They can't turn to Putin and Russia. They're too busy in Syria and with the oil prices and their own tensions. And they can't turn to China because China's just not going to play that role of filling the security vacuum that the United States basically occupied. So the options are, are pretty limited for Saudi Arabia. And, and I'm not sure that pushing their weight around will get them what they want. Hmm. And in all of these actually raise really interesting questions for UK's policy um, and sure. UK's engagement with Saudi Arabia. But it is the question of how do we balance question of Iran um, with our closest ally, which is the United States, and clearly we're not sharing the same perspective. Saudi Arabia, we're much more willing to stand with them and share their concerns, and obviously their security is important for stability in the region and oil production, but also our alliance with them. Um, but it raises a lot of questions, and how could the UK handle this very complex portfolio, and what are key implications you see, and what is a path um, through these for the UK to follow? Sure. Well, I think that there is just a starting premise here, which is that when you talk about Gulf security, I think that the UK, by virtue of its history in the region, has a very, very strong and uniquely deep set of relationships across the Gulf states, and that includes Saudi Arabia, but has always had to, since 1971, look to the United States for some sort of guidance on what the security architecture should look like in the region, what we should be doing in terms of thinking about deterrence, thinking about um, ways to deal uh, with the problems of insecurity with Iraq, and then the GCC was formed and it was Iran, and then they started squabbling amongst themselves. And ultimately, it's very difficult for the UK to move out by itself if it looks like it's publicly disagreeing with the United States. Having said that, I think what we've done um, has been quite intelligent in the sense that we have made it very, very clear to the Americans that we do not support their particular view on the JCPOA. That's the nuclear deal and the collapse of the nuclear deal. We would like to see that uh, maintained and, and we would like some sort of relief for the Iranians right now, given their incredibly difficult health problems that they're going through. And actually, the UK has been very clear that 
it thinks that the US should actually ease up on some of these sanctions because it's actually doing more harm than good um, in the short, medium and long term. However, where I think we're in lockstep with the United States and uh, our Gulf partners, including Saudi Arabia, is that Iran's influence in the region is malign. There's no doubt in my mind that Iran has both capitalized and worked towards the weakening of various states, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, just being three examples, uh, Lebanon, of course, it's built an incredibly developed set of proxy militias built on the model of Hezbollah since 1982. And it is using them to further its own ends and to make sure that these states are partially dysfunctional and that they will always take Tehran's preferences into account. And if they need to, they can turn to violence. And that gives them this sort of credibility of being able to respond through violence, but also through politics. Let's not forget, Hezbollah is voted and has seats in the parliament in the democratic elections in Lebanon. It's the same thing with its partners uh, in Iraq. It's the same thing, actually, the Houthis were trying legitimately to be in the government of Yemen as well. And of course, well, I mean, Syria is a very complicated issue, but Bashar al-Assad is the president at the moment, uh, and he would say that he was voted in legitimately. So the thing is this, is that all these allies that Iran has built across the region, and that we and the United States and the French and the Germans have problems with, I think there does need to be a very concerted effort to say to the Iranians, hey, this has to stop. You cannot keep doing this and expecting goodwill to follow. We are with you in terms of the fact that we think, you know, the United States has treated you a bit harshly on the nuclear deal. You were complying, absolutely. Nobody's saying that you weren't. But things have changed. You have, through your proxy militias, uh, attacked US and UK personnel who were actually fighting ISIS, in Iraq and Syria, and you've stabilized the situation there. And you have also used your own forces to attack tankers in the Gulf and to attack uh, partners and allies, including Saudi Arabia, and pretend that it wasn't you. I mean, everybody knows that Iran attacked Saudi Arabia in October 2019. That is not a secret. And there's been some very good work done showing where the missiles originated from. That has to stop. If the Iranians want some sort of detente in the region and to be treated as a reasonable player, then they've got to play reasonably. You know, they cannot attack civilian infrastructure and expect to get away with it. So here's the issue. You know, the UK and the US have obviously come together in a maritime security mission. Uh, the Europeans under uh, Macron have sort of got a parallel French-led mission coming out of Abu Dhabi. Um, but nevertheless, those warships and those flotillas uh, as part of you know what used to be called op sentinel um didn't need to be there if the iranians weren't attacking civilian infrastructure but they have and i think this is something that the iranians need to understand is that their actions have led to reactions they may think that it's all very unfair and blame trump and everything else but they didn't have to choose the pathway that they did and you know nobody really wants to have to spend lots of money policing the gulf um, because we would like to, I think, and that includes, you know, the community of nations, see a, a region where a third of the world's oil is produced in some sort of state of security and stability. But if Iran threatens that, then there has to be a response. And, and countries like the US, France, the UK, Japan, even China and India are talking about helping the missions out there, um, have to ensure that these, uh, these uh, pathways for 30% of the global energy supply are secured. Oh. Iran needs to understand that and at the moment i don't think that they are uh, mike um thank you so much this has been a very rich conversation uh, obviously the fact that we end up this discussion with um discussing iran and security in the gulf and stability and and actually it's importance for us and, and and why we need to be engaging with this conversation um thank you so much and ladies and gentlemen thank you also so much for watching and sharing this um if you have not received it directly i'm sure you will see it if you want to sign up to receive our weekly newsletter and products like this, please do reach out to us at www.chaser.org.uk or within um, our official email chains um, and see you next time. And thank you so much, Mike, again.